Exodus 12, 1 through 20. And Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. This is the Darby Bible, by the way. Darby translation here. Verse 3, Speak unto all the assembly of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month let them take themselves each a lamb for a father's house, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too small for a lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Each according to the measure of his eating shall you count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a yearling male. Ye shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. And the whole congregation of the assembly of Israel shall kill it between the two evenings. And they shall take of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, with bitter herbs shall they eat it. Ye shall eat none of it raw, nor boiled at all with water, but roast with fire its head, with its legs, and with its inwards. And ye shall let none of it remain until the morning, and what remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. And thus ye shall eat it. Your loins shall be girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is Yahweh's Passover. And I will go through the land of Egypt in that night and smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the mighty ones of Egypt. I will execute judgment. I am Yahweh. And the blood shall be for you as a sign on the houses in which ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be among you for destruction when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall celebrate it as a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations as an ordinance forever shall ye celebrate it. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. On the very first day you shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And on the first day you shall have a holy convocation, and on the seventh day a holy convocation. No manner of work shall be done on them, save what is eaten by every person. That only shall be done by you. And you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread, for in this same day have I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. And you shall keep this day in your generations as an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, in the evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month in the evening. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eateth what is leavened, that soul shall be cut off from the assembly of Israel. Whether he be a sojourner or born in the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwellings shall ye eat unleavened bread. May Yahweh bless his word to our hearts today. So this is a text that most of us here are familiar with, uh, especially at this time of the year when we observe the Passover and Feast of Unleavened Bread. I think back to my very first Passover. I was overjoyed to be keeping Passover because I was not raised celebrating Passover, but I was overjoyed. And I'm still just as joyous today. Passover is my favorite day of the year. You might have a different favorite day. One man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems another day. That's fine. My favorite day is Passover. I look forward to it. I prepare a lot for it. And I make sure that we do it the best that we know how to do. If you'd like to go back through the entire chapter, I would encourage you to read this chapter, not just the first 20 verses, but the entire 12th chapter of Exodus every day this week to kind of build up your anticipation to the Passover. Also, a couple of years ago, I decided to do a verse-by-verse -verse teaching through every verse in Exodus 12. And you can watch that entire series on my YouTube channel or on the website. I think there's 13 lessons in all. And you can go, I actually go from Exodus 11, verse 1, to Exodus 12, verse 51. And we cover every verse. It's an in-depth teaching there. But I just read the first 20 verses in this chapter to get some context in our minds for the lesson today. 
But I only want to address today in this lesson one question that I get every single year and I've gotten several times already this year from several different people, not just here, but people that contact me by way of phone or, or messenger or whatever. And the question is this, Brother Matthew, what exactly is it that we are to remove from our homes during the feast? Now the pertinent verses here in chapter 12 are verse 15, 19, and 20. In verse 15, Yahweh commands us to eat unleavened bread and to put away, we'll come back to that phrase, put away, and to put away leaven out of your houses. Verse 19 says, no leaven is to be found in our homes for seven days. And verse 20 then tells us not to eat anything leavened, but instead eat unleavened bread. Some believers, including myself in the past, in the early 2000s, I went through about a, I don't know, four or five year stint where I took this to the extreme and I removed all leavening agents from my home. Things like baking soda, baking powder, vinegar, and some people that you talk to even say eggs. We get the eggs out because they can be used as a leavening agent by whipping them together maybe with some cream. So there were a few years that Tisha and I got rid of our toothpaste and maybe some deodorants or vinegar, things that contain vinegar like mustard and ketchup, salad dressing. As we continue to read and study and meditate on the commandment and always asking the Father that we want to do what's right. We don't want to take away, but we also don't want to add to. Sometimes I think we're more worried about taking away than we are adding to. <laughs> Because it's scary that we take things away and we live in a Christianity today that has taken a lot of things away. But we have to always remind ourselves we don't want to add anything to the commandments either. We don't want to be guilty of adding traditions that maybe violate commandments or traditions that we hold up to the standard of a commandment. We don't want to be guilty of that. So I believe that we came to what is a better view for probably the past about 15 years. And the better view, I think, is that bread is what's in view in the context and the actual finished product of leaven, which is bread, is the staple of diet, not just for the Hebrews, but for humanity as a whole. So for the last approximately 15 years, we've been removing all risen bread from our homes and then eating unleavened bread for seven days. Tisha usually makes homemade unleavened bread. And we don't really concern ourselves with putting out things like mustard or salad dressing or toothpaste or baking soda or baking powder. Uh, for starters here in Exodus 12, 15, 19 through 20, the contrast to bread or to leaven is unleavened bread. It's the festival of unleavened bread, Chag Matzot in Hebrew. We are to eat the opposite of what we are to remove. So what is put away would then be the raised loaf of bread. What is eaten is the flat, quick bread, the unleavened bread. Why do we do this? There's not many churches that you would go to that you'd hear a sermon like this this week. I think maybe they're celebrating Palm Sunday tomorrow, maybe. I don't know. I did a search one time in my Bible computer on my phone and punched in Palm Sunday and I couldn't find it. It said zero instances in the Bible. But you can find many times where it talks about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, right? Why, why do you teach a sermon like this, Brother Matthew? This is all just a waste of time. Why in the world would anybody want to practice any of that? Let's get back to love. People have told me, let's just get back to love. Well, 1 John 5 verse 3 says this. This is the love of Yahweh, or Elohim, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not grievous. Some Bibles say they're not a burden. So this is getting back to love. The reason that we're concerned with any commandment is because our Creator gave us a way to practice, a way to live. We memorialize here with the feast a great occurrence in the history of Israel. We love Yahweh. We want to please Yahweh. So we meditate, as Psalm 1 verse 2 says, on His law, His Torah, day and night. Day and night. That leaves no room. We're always meditating on His law. Why? Because what's important to Him is important to us. And so if He gives us a commandment, we want to be obedient to it to the best that we understand. I cannot make somebody see that, but that's why we do the things that we do. 
It's because we love the Creator. They say it's all about love. Yes, it is. And love is the keeping of the commandments. We love our Creator. Now, before we get into the technicalities of this, I want to talk about different understandings and perspectives in regards to some of the commandments. What I always encourage people to do is walk in what you are able to see at any particular point in time. You can only do what you understand to do. So you walk the best you know how in what you see at whatever stage or level that you're in. And at the same time, this one sometimes is difficult for people. At the same time, be courteous to your neighbor who loves the Creator just like you do and is walking in what they see at that point in time even if it differs from your practice and what you see. Recognize that somebody else can love Yahweh and not see things exactly like you see them. Maybe I need to repeat that again. Maybe not so in here. I think we have a lot of love for our neighbor here. It's the second greatest commandment. But I found in this particular Hebraic movement for the last, man, 25 years now, that sometimes people have a hard time doing that. They think, if you don't see things exactly like me, you must not love the Creator. And that's just not, just not true in all times. Sometimes it can be, but it's just not true in all times. When two people love the Almighty and they seek to follow His instructions, yet they come to slightly different understandings on a particular commandment, there should not be a fight. Discussion is great. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, Proverbs says. But we should be respectful of other honest and serious views people get from their study of the Scriptures. So, in the Hebrew faith, for a long time now, there have been various schools of thought on how certain individual commandments are best carried out. Rabbis, teachers of the Torah, learned teachers of the law would sometimes disagree on how to interpret certain commandments. I'm not talking about huge commandments like do not murder or do not commit adultery, but minor commandments, uh, what we might, we might call less weighty commandments like we're talking about today. They would read the commandment, they would discuss, they would come with different perspectives, different understandings, thus we get what's called the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. I talked about that when I preached on divorce and remarriage. Or recently we talked about the school of Akiva and the school of Yishmael. They disagreed on certain aspects, remember, in Leviticus 17 in regards to the sacrifices and the slaughterings. And even when there are times when only one angle is correct, we need to be mindful that everyone is not at the same level or stage of understanding, and that is okay. I did not understand everything I do now 20 years ago. I still loved Yahweh 20 years ago, and I was still obeying Him the best that I knew. But I look back now and I think, man, I had a lot wrong, and maybe some things I still believe and I had right. But we grow, hopefully we grow, as we serve our Heavenly Father. Just because a believer is at a smaller stage of development does not mean they're not a believer. A full-grown cherry tomato plant ready to harvest off of once began as a seed. You termed it as a tomato seed. Full-grown plants, a tomato plant, both belong in the family. Different stages, different levels. So what I share with you today is my current stage of development. It's where I'm at right now. It doesn't mean I will never change. It doesn't mean I can't learn more and grow. Right. It's just what I think is the best way to understand the commandment at this present time. So one of the biggest and most important things, if not the most important thing, in Bible study is context. Both the immediate context of a passage and also, and a lot of people miss this, the cultural context or the life setting of when the passage or the text was initially given. So for example, when this command was given about unleavened bread and removing the leaven, there were no Fleischmann's yeast packets. There was not a Publix 15 minutes away in town or a Kroger if you prefer Kroger. I'm a Publix man myself. Where shopping is a pleasure, right? <laughs> Nobody had bread making machines. Now, when I say these things, we smile, we chuckle. It's because they're humorous and they're obvious. 
But we sometimes subconsciously forget the obvious when we do Bible study. And we get sidetracked because we don't even realize that we're reading things into the text simply because it's how we were raised to believe. Or maybe not even raised religiously to believe, it's just how we were brought up culturally. And we read it and we interpret it in a way that makes sense to our culture, but it wasn't written to Matthew and John and Frankie. It was written to ancient Hebrews a long time ago. And so we have to understand what it meant at first if we want to make application now. The Bible was not written in English. It wasn't written to an American culture. Uh, the text, at least the one that we're reading from today, was written in Hebrew to a Hebrew culture, ancient Near Eastern culture. As a believer in Yahweh, Holy Scripture was written for you, but it was not written directly to you. And the way to best understand what you are to do now is to go back to what the text originally meant then. I never liked it when I was growing up in youth class when we would go over a text and somebody would say, what does this mean to you? What does that text mean to you? I think that we can get there in a healthy way and finally ask what a text means to us, but not before we ask what did it originally mean. I really don't think you can even understand how to apply it to your life if you don't understand what it originally meant. I've messed up and had to repent on this so many times in my life serving the Creator, and I'm sure that I will have to continue to do so as He continues to work on me to make me what I ought to be. Amen? He's not done with me yet, so forgive me for the areas that I lack. Let's go back to the commandment. Exodus 12, verse 15. We read that seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. The Hebrew word here is matzah. That's a good word to kind of memorize. It's defined in various lexicons as bread or cake without leaven, an unfermented cake or loaf. Now this does not mean you cannot eat unleavened bread other days of the year. You can. I kind of like flat bread. Okay? But it just means you must eat it for these seven days. It's a commandment to eat unleavened bread for seven days at this particular time of the year. Why? What's the meaning or the purpose here? Well, back in verse 8, we read that the Passover was eaten with unleavened bread. The Passover, the Hebrew word Pesach, actually technically doesn't really refer to a day in the Torah. It refers to the animal itself, and that's for another lesson another time. But you eat the Pesach, which is the animal, the lamb or the goat. You eat it with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs. And then in verse 11, you kind of join those two verses together here in the context. It says that when you eat it, you are to eat it in haste or hurriedly. And it gives some criteria with your shoes on your feet or your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, and your loins girded. Some Bibles say your belt around your waist. When a Hebrew man would gird up his loins, he would kind of pull up his robe in between his legs and tie it up so that he could get to where he was going a little bit faster, maybe for war or for a journey. Basically ready for travel. So the point here is that once the final plague on Egypt occurred, remember the death of the firstborn from which we get the ordinances of the Passover stems from the tenth and last plague upon the land of Egypt. And when that plague occurred, the Israelites would immediately find favor in the sight of the Egyptians and the Egyptians would push or thrust them out of the land of Egypt and they'd have to leave in a hurry. And that's exactly what we read in Exodus 12, 29 through 34. Let's look at it. And it came to pass that at midnight Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle and Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his bondmen and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house in which there was not one dead. And he called Moses and Aaron in the night and said, Rise up, go away from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve Yahweh as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds as ye have said, and go and bless me also. And the Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, we are all dead men. And look at verse 34 in particular. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. 
They were thrust out of Egypt in a hurry, verse 33. Verse 34 ties this end to leaving hurriedly. With their dough, it says, dough is flour and water mixture. With their dough with them, before it was leavened, before it had time to rise. That's what it means, before it was leavened. The Good News Bible translates verse 34 as this. So the people filled their baking pans with unleavened dough, wrapped them in clothing, and carried them on their shoulders. Now, couple verse 34 with verse 39. It says, And they baked the dough that they brought forth out of Egypt into unleavened cakes, for it was not leavened. For they were driven out of Egypt and could not wait. Neither had they prepared for themselves any food. Same verse, verse 39, Good News Bible. They baked unleavened bread from the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for they had been driven out of Egypt so suddenly that they did not have time to get their food ready or to prepare leavened dough. So this context here in Exodus 12 explains what we began reading back in verse 15 about eating unleavened bread for the feast and abstaining from leaven. It is specifically in context about bread and it has to do with unleavened bread being able to be made quickly and leavened bread taking time. Let me mention this again. Unleavened and leavened are opposites. If what we are to eat by commandment is unleavened bread, then what we are to abstain from and put away is leavened bread. And the word used for leavened bread back in verse 15 is the Hebrew word chametz. I know Brother Sandy likes the Hebrew. It's the Hebrew word chametz. And it means fermented bread or a loaf or puffed up bread. And that's what we are to be concerned with here. We remove bread, regular bread that we just call bread, or leavened bread from our homes during the feast. And one of the reasons I think we remove it from our homes is so we don't accidentally eat it. Getting rid of a loaf of bread from your home keeps you from violating the commandment to abstain from it during the feast. Now, I know that it does that because the times when I've accidentally broken this command, anybody ever broke the command and ate bread during the feast of unleavened bread? Well, I have many times. But I didn't break it because I was eating at my home. I broke it maybe because I drove through Zaxby's and got some toast in the meal. <laughs> and accidentally ate the bread. And then got home and remembered, oh my goodness. I ate bread during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Things like that, when they happen, what they do is they remind us that Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20, I think it's verse 20 is right, it says, There is not a just man on earth who does good and never sins. Come on, come on. <laughs> verse 29 it says, Behold, I have found that Yahweh made man upright, but they have sought out many schemes. Amen. So we think sometimes, and we get puffed up like that leavened bread, puff our chest up, we think we're pretty righteous and we're doing pretty good, and then Yahweh has to humble us and remind us, Amen. You're not the Messiah. Amen. You're not the anointed one. I sent him for you. You didn't come for him. So we're reminded of those things in that, in that occasion or that occurrence. I think this is why Yahweh says get it out of our house during the feast. I have had some brothers and sisters say that they only eat at home during the Feast of Unleavened Bread to try to make sure that they don't violate it by accident. I think that's a good practice. Now, although it's not the main purpose of this lesson, I put this in my notes. This teaches us an important principle when there is something in your life that causes you to sin, you should cut it off and throw it away. We should be trying to make it harder to sin, not easier to sin. Amen? So Yeshua mentions this in Matthew 5 where He says, If your right eye offends you, pluck it out. If your right hand offends you, cut it off. It's better for you to go into the kingdom of heaven maimed than to enter Gehenna with a full body. So if there's something that causes you to sin, get rid of it. Make it harder for yourself to sin, not easier. Some people point to Exodus 12, verse 15, where we read, You shall put away leaven out of your houses. This is where we're going to get a little bit technical here. I have confidence in everybody, though. I believe you'll follow it. You shall put away leaven out of your houses. Some people point to this verse, and the word leaven here is, is not the word chametz, but it is the Hebrew word seor. These are the two words used. Seor is only used, I think, like five times in the Hebrew Bible. Chametz is used uh, a lot more. 
Um, but I want you to notice here the two different Hebrew numberings. This is from Strong's. The first word, leaven, there is 7603. Uh, the second phrase, leavened bread, is 2557. The first one is seor. The second one there is chametz. Seor is used just a handful of times, and while it can be used interchangeably with leavened bread, it may at times refer to the starter dough that was saved from a previous batch of bread and then placed into the next batch to make the leavening process quicker. You're familiar with a couple of verses in the Bible that says, A little leaven leaveneth the lump. Well, this is what I'm talking about when I mention the starter dough. If you've baked bread from scratch, you'll get this part probably a little bit quicker. It still took longer to make the leavened bread if you had starter dough than making unleavened bread. But if you had to start from complete scratch, it would take, some say three days, some say seven days, some say a week and a half to get a good starter dough to make another good plump loaf of bread. Now, I'm of the belief, this is Brother Matthew's uh, perspective, that a person's starter dough was not required to be removed from their home, only the finished product of a risen loaf of bread. A couple of reasons. Number one, people didn't eat their starter dough. What you're looking at there in the little mason jar, that wasn't eaten. That was kept in a place and was used for making something that would be eaten. So people didn't eat that in the first place. Um, it was kept tucked away, and so catch this. When Yahweh gives the command not to eat leaven during the feast, the Israelites weren't eating their starter dough to begin with. So nobody was eating that. So it doesn't make any sense for Yahweh say, to say don't eat that when they're not eating that to start with. What they are eating is a raised loaf of bread. It's a staple diet. Give us this day our daily bread. Now I know that stands for food in general, but the reason bread is used is because it's the staple of, of humanity. It's, it's what, we, what we eat a lot of. Furthermore, as we read earlier in verses 34 and 39, the Israelites had their dough with them when they left Egypt, and it was inside of a kneading trough. Kneading trough just means probably anciently a wooden bowl in which the dough was formed and, and, and kneaded. You kind of see one there on the screen that they're pouring some, some water into to mix with the, with the flour there and the doughy substance. And the way that yeast was and still is gathered from complete scratch is by letting your dough, your flour and water mixture, sit outside or even inside and gather yeast spores which are always present in the air. They're here right now with us. And they're not going to leave. We can't command them to get out during the feast. <laughs> the yeast spores are going to be in the air. And that's how starter dough is formed from scratch. So while the dough was wrapped up in clothes and on their shoulders in the kneading troughs, they were exiting Egypt. Yeast was all in the air and the dough would have had to collect some even if a little during the leaving in haste. So the point is this, they did not go through the process of letting the dough sit out to collect yeast and then bringing it back in and kneading it. And then letting it sit out some more to collect yeast and we're talking about a day or days each time and then bringing it back in and kneading it. That took days to accomplish from scratch. So what I want to do now is I looked up three or four uh, videos, instructional videos on YouTube this week. Some of them were quite long. I've condensed two of them down to about a four minute segment here and I'm going to show on the screen. Um, I'll put links to the entirety of these videos in the show notes when I post this on YouTube. And I will also put a link to a 46 minute instructional video where a lady that knows what she's talking about, elderly lady in making bread, she goes through this 46 minute instructional video and you're welcome to watch that if you'd like to. I watched the whole thing, it was very informative. And these are not necessarily re religious videos or biblical videos, they're just people that are talking about capturing and gathering wild yeast to make bread from complete scratch. Yeast was a later development whose origin isn't entirely known for sure. But as wild yeast is present nearly everywhere, it's easy to imagine it getting accidentally discovered at some point. Either way, bread leavened with yeast began being made in Egypt by 4000 BCE. It quickly became the standard in many parts of the world. For my yeast, I made a batch of watery flour and left it out near our tomato plants. Yeast are attracted to sugary plants, like tomatoes, so it should be a ripe area to collect some. 
After a few hours of exposure, I brought it inside to cultivate for the next few days somewhere warm and continue to feed it additional flour as we go. Check it out. All right, so I got the freshly ground flour and the yeast culture that's been cultivating. Got some water, got some honey. Let's make some Egyptian bread. After kneading the dough, it's left to rise for an hour. Then knead it again. And left to rise once more. Want to bake some bread but don't have access to commercial yeast? No problem. You just mix some flour with some water, let it sit at room temperature, and wait for it to grow some yeast all by itself. Yeah, seriously, it works. It's called making a sourdough starter. Commercial yeast is so powerful that it rises a dough with bubbles in just a couple hours, long before bacteria have had much of a chance to grow inside the dough. In contrast, making a sourdough starter with wild yeast takes about a week and a half at least, which leaves plenty of time for bacterial action that will put the sour in sour. The first step in this procedure from NC State is to mix together a couple of tablespoons of flour with a couple of tablespoons of water in a mason jar or another narrow glass container. With the water in, you just cover your starter with something porous, like a towel. The googly eyes are optional, but I'm calling my starter Gary. This will keep big things like hair from floating into your starter, but it will allow microbes from the air to pass through. And yes, there is yeast in the air. Bakers always used to say that the yeast are in the air. Then some of them started doing some experiments where they got starters going inside seal containers, and the starters grew anyway. This led them to conclude that the yeast and the bacteria are already in the flour. And indeed, flour definitely does contain yeast and bacteria. There's a battle going on in the jar between the various microbes, and we need to give the desirable bacteria time to win that battle. Here's one starter I did on day three. It's pink and smells disgusting. That's an indication that some undesirable microbes are winning. I got kind of freaked out and threw it down the sink, but the folks at NC State said I probably should have stuck with it. The acid-producing bacteria might have won if given time. And how do you stick with it? By feeding your starter. There's a really specific procedure that you can follow on this NC State website, but the basic idea is this. Once a day, you dump and throw away half of your starter. You then put in enough fresh flour and water to double the mass of what you have left and to keep it the texture of thick pancake batter. After you do that for a few days, you should start to notice some clear liquid accumulating in the jar. Bakers call that hooch. It's literally alcohol created by the yeast and it's an indication that they are hungry. Once you start getting a lot of hooch after half a day, that means you can start feeding it twice a day. After about 14 feedings, you should have a starter that reliably doubles in size between feedings. That means you've got a vigorous community of yeast and desirable bacteria that can reproduce perpetually as long as you keep feeding it. If you put it in the fridge at this point, you can get away with only feeding it about once a week. Cold slows down the metabolic rate. You then use about half a cup of starter to replace a teaspoon of yeast in a recipe. You just got to account for all the extra flour and water you're adding to the process, and be aware that wild sourdough usually takes more time to rise four hours a day it depends on the starter once we understand this there's an interesting point from the Hebrew text of Exodus 12 15 that I think probably comes into play here and it's the words put away in Hebrew when it says you are to put away the leaven that word put away there or the phrase is actually from the word Shabbat uh, 76 73 in Hebrew that word's most often translated as cease or rest. As a matter of fact, out of the 17 times that that particular Hebrew word is used in the Torah, it's only translated put away one time, and that's right here. And I'm using the King James Version uses here. So what this could carry the meaning of is causing your starter to rest during the feast. In other words, you put it away, you don't use it for anything, and you don't add anything to it to make it grow during the feast. I don't think it had to be removed from the home because you weren't eating it to start with. And some people get these good sourdough starters and pass them down for generations at a time. I don't think they had to be thrown out every year. So in conclusion, if an Israelite, and this is where we come to, there's a couple of ways to understand this. If an Israelite was required to remove their starter dough along with leavened bread from their homes, there would be no possible way for them to eat a loaf of bread when the feast was over. Now catch me there? So if they got rid of everything and had to start from scratch completely, we're talking about ancient Israel, 
Remember, they could not go down to Publix and buy bread. Someone might say, well, they could buy it from an outsider, but that wouldn't always be possible in ancient times, especially in the wilderness. So either one of two things, either it didn't matter if bread could be eaten immediately after the feast and the focus was more on the commandment to eat unleavened bread, that's a possibility. That is a possibility that the commandment was just eat unleavened bread, not that you had to be able to eat loaf bread right after the feast. However, the commandment in Exodus 12, it sounds like to me in the commandment that Yahweh is saying there's a way that after the 21st day at even, you can eat bread again. That's what it sounds like to me. At least that's where I'm at right now. Which is the second option, is that the Israelites had a way to make a new risen loaf right after the feast ended. And I tend to side with this second view that they kept their starter dough and since, and I speak to our Lunar Sabbatarian view here now, and since the closing Sabbath after the feast it has a cooking allowance, we read it in Exodus 12 verse 18, ancient Hebrews could use that day to spend a few hours, take some starter dough, get them a nice fresh loaf of bread ready, and in a few hours bake uh, a loaf of bread for everybody to eat if they so desired. Once again, the language used in Exodus 12 sounds to me like it was possible to eat leavened bread the day after the feast was over with. So I think that's the better of the two options, but you could go with, with either one there if you believe that the starter has to be removed. Now, to wrap up this study, I believe that the context of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the immediate linguistic context in Exodus 12 in the Hebrew, and the cultural context of the life setting of the Hebrews in ancient times is a reference to getting rid of bread during the feast, what we normally eat and call bread, you get rid of that during the feast, and you eat unleavened bread that can be made in a matter of minutes. And you remember each day that you remember it, you remember how that the Israelites of old were thrust out in a hurry and didn't have time to bake or make and bake what they would normally have eaten probably daily. I don't think that baking soda and toothpaste are in view here. I think that people arrive at that understanding from coming at it, starting from a modern view and trying to read that back into the Bible. I think what's in view here is bread. I definitely don't believe that products like mustard or salad dressing are in view here either. I think what's in view is bread. And I also don't believe that if you do have a starter dough, which some people, several sisters that I've gotten comments from on Facebook have said, you know, hey, I make bread all the time and I've got the starter dough that took me, you know, 10 days or 14 days to, to get going. And, and one sister said that she had gotten the best starter that she had ever made. And last year during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, she was unsure about it. And so because she was unsure, she went ahead and threw it out. And, you know, that's a noble decision. But now she sees that she probably didn't have to throw it out. She's leaning more in that direction now. Um, I don't think that you have to throw out the, the starter dough. The focus is on bread, both leavened and unleavened. Get rid of the bread out of your house, cookies, cakes, loaf bread, etc. And eat unleavened flat bread for seven days. Won't hear a sermon like this too often, right? <laughs> so, praise Yahweh for His Word. So, if you have any questions, you can see me after the service is over. I appreciate your attention, not to me, but to the Word of Yahweh. And let's try to obey the best that we know how, amen? I love everybody. <laughs>